April a year ago, a friend of mine, Dan Holowak, CEO of Crowdrift, made a prescient comment. He said, in a world where almost every interaction we were having started and ended on a digital device, that the pace of technological change was likely to see what would have happened over the next five years jammed into 18 months. Well, that certainly has been the case as we all got infinitely better at living, working, and navigating a virtual world, or not. A year and a half later, we're still looking at another 18 months or so of recovery. And if that's the case and you use Dan's math, the changes we face over the next 10 years have basically be jammed into 36 month crash course that started in March, 2020. It's not just technology, but the way we do business and how we live our lives, remote working, grocery shopping, entertainment, travel, banking, medical services, health and wellness, employment. If you think about it, all of these have been drastically altered over the last 18 months, and they're not gonna go back to the way they were before. Change is the constant now more than ever, and my next guest is no stranger to either change or a challenge. He's worked in the airline industry, the hotel industry, he's managed world-class destinations, and today he heads up one of the largest and most respected tourism industry associations in the world. Don Welsh joined what was then Destination Marketing Association International in 2016 and has led a team that has reinvented and rebranded Destinations International. I've had the great pleasure working with Don over the last five years, both as a board member and as a peer. And I can say without reservation that I am incredibly grateful for the work he has championed at Destinations International. Long before COVID, DI was focused on the relevance of destination organizations and the idea of reestablishing those organizations in the context of community values. Powerful stuff and an essential part of my own personal model for sustainable destination development. Good morning, Don. How are you? Where are you? What's it like? Hey, David, how are you? First of all, what a beautiful introduction. And, uh, and as we get into our discussion today, I may be one of those people that have been living on my phone, Zooms, and uh, I'm actually joining you from um, my, my new place. Uh, we sold a place in, in Washington, D.C. recently, and we, we, we have relocated to uh, Millsboro, Delaware, which is uh, right near Rehoboth Beach. So I'm about a two hour drive in the DC and when I need to be in the city, I'm, I'm there, but I'm also uh, frequently traveling and I'm pleased to say, David, I've been on the road a little bit lately. So great to be with you. I'm just gonna jump right into this one. You got way out in the front of the idea of destination relevance almost almost six years ago. And with, with us in the industry sort of seeing the fruits of that initiative in the last three, four years. What is relevance? Why does it matter so much? What do you think? Well, first of all, you know, I have a great team of people that uh, that I work with for, believe it or not, uh, 10 years now. And uh, as you know, one of the great architects on this whole community shared value in our industry is uh, Jack Johnson. So the work that Jack has done, Melissa Cherry and our team, very proud of it. And, and I think that if you start looking at our industry, uh, you know, there, there, are, there are quite a few silver linings we've seen since the pandemic. And I would say one of uh, the biggest has been the, the value um, proposition that our members have for their destinations around the world. And um, I, I know it may be odd to say that, but I, I think in many cases, the CVB, DMO, whatever, it, it, whatever name it goes by has probably never been more relevant in the eyes of its key stakeholders, uh, far beyond just hotels and restaurants and attractions and convention centers, but also the, the key leaders and communities as well as elected leaders. I think that's that's a great observation. I'm going to temper it and say potentially relevant because we know we've got a lot of work to do here. Let's go back to your your days at DMO level, Indy, um, Seattle, Chicago. You're you're a network builder. You build a network of engaged stakeholders who move things forward. Talk to me a little bit about the days in Chicago and what it what what you can tell us as we navigate our way out of COVID and as we seek as destination organizations and destination entities to really actually achieve and become that relevance that we're talking about. Well, you know, I had the, I had the good fortune of spending five years in Seattle to sort of learn the business because I didn't come from that business. Then I spent uh, two and a half great years in Indianapolis, where I must tell you, of all the places I worked in, uh, in terms of the entire community embracing a de an organization, it's been Indianapolis. And uh, then went to Chicago. And the great thing there is myself and a few others had a chance to build a new organization from scratch. 
Uh, we created something uh, to sort of break down uh, the different organizations that it touched tours and what marketing or whether it was on the leisure piece or whether it was conventions. There were multiple organizations, therefore multiple messages. And we created uh, Choose Chicago. And I must say that um, the community embraced it. The key stakeholders embraced it. And when you have a uh, passionate, committed mayor, as, as we did, Rahm Emanuel at the time, um, it made our life a little bit easier. And um, But I think it was also the fact we were very passionately committed to our stakeholders and the brand, and we had a great city in Chicago. Where, can you give me an example, Indy, Seattle, or Chicago, of an initiative that you think really moved the ball forward in terms of the this idea of creating community shared value? It, it's We're all conversant in those words now, thanks to Jack and his brilliant work on the lexicon. Five, you know, 10 years ago to be calling it community shared values, people would look at you like, what are you talking about? But can you give us an example of the stuff you were doing that was a, a sort of a precursor to what we're doing now? You know, David, I think I had the benefit. If I go back to Seattle, since it was, I was new, I didn't come from that industry. Steve Morris hired me, had been in Seattle for a long time. He he subsequently left and I had the chance to be the CEO. And I think, I think when we began doing our own version of community shared value, and that was quite a while ago, um, we, we more or less were very successful in mobilizing the, the key stakeholders on the tourism side. We were able to get the hotels and the restaurants and the attractions, and we really set off on that mission. The good thing also, we were able to really engage a lot of the community leaders, uh, you know, the lawyers, the doctors, the people that ran companies in, in Seattle, and they sort of understood where we didn't have that final, I guess, uh, that third stale, uh, third stale, uh, uh, step on the on the on the stool was really in the area of our elected leaders, and that was I guess that stood in the back of my mind that you know they saw the benefit, they saw the jobs, they talk saw the taxes, the revenues, and everything associated, but they couldn't get politically behind it. And uh, you know we'd see that on numerous occasions in the city council. You know then I make the move to Indianapolis, and that's a city that I will tell you gets it at every different level. Uh, you know, from government to the private sector, to the public sector, to, tour, uh, to the tourism sector, they get it. And I think that is a unique element of uh, Indianapolis. And certainly Leonard's done a great job of uh, carrying on the great work there. You know, in Chicago, I think, you know, we were able to do some really cool things. And again, with Jack being there, we were able to really say, OK, we, you know, you can only go to Michigan Avenue so many times. You can only, you know, visit that strip. But when we began exploring taking the message to the neighborhoods and really engaging, you know, Pils the Pilsen community or wherever it was, the Chicago South Side and all the great things to do there, then all of a sudden it began to be a collective neighborhood brand. It wasn't just downtown Chicago. And uh, probably at the infancy stages of, uh, of community shared value, we understood that we needed to change the way we communicated to our local stakeholders. We needed to make sure that somehow we didn't gloss over and throw these huge numbers, uh, you know, into the hundreds of millions or billions of dollars, whatever the number is. But we made it, we need to make sure that it related to the local community in the neighborhoods so they can understand what a tourist meant to them, uh, why they should be involved in the organization. So that would be probably, I'd say, um, the work I was most proud of that we began actually working on a community shared value um, quite a while ago. So that's amazing and fascinating for me because, you know, if I go back a decade or a little less and I look, you know, Chicago's marketing was something we paid great attention to here in Toronto, Canada. You guys had nailed it and you were on the early curve of telling local stories. You've got massive destination, you know, Twin Towers at each end of town, like you say, the Mer you know, the miles there. But you really did start early on telling these these granular stories about Chicago, didn't you? I think we did. I think that, you know, you start looking at different sectors. You know, McCormick, from a convention standpoint, it's huge. It's a major player. But, you know, then we got into the culinary piece. And then we got into the art scene. And then we got into the music scene. And we tried to make sure that somehow when we told these stories, they were unique and disparate enough that they would appeal to the people that, you know, may be coming into Chicago just for a culinary experience. And then when you started lining up all the James Beard chefs and all these great, you know, chef owned restaurants, that began to be its own story into itself. And, um, and, so and, and that did culminate with you actually getting to host the James Beard Awards. I did not culminate. It did actually had a high point. It did. And I'm pleased to say, I think 
Chicago still is the the host city and uh, of James Beard, and uh, it really did put it on the uh, and you know the same thing could be said for uh, in the area of sports. So you started taking the things that were relevant and things that were really tangible of Chicago, and you just serve them up creatively to the audience, and you know good things happen. Well, and I I would be fascinated to be a fly on the wall watching you and Jack Johnson work through this at the time because in the process of gathering the content that would make up the stories that is the mosaic of Chicago, you cannot help but build that stakeholder alignment, can you? If the, if the stories are authentic and the people are authentic, you've already started to gather the base ingredients for, for strong community engagement. You know, Jack and I were blessed also to do that. But remember, we also had Melissa Cherry as our chief marketing officer. Totally. So, uh, Melissa, born and bred in Chicago. This is her home, you know, as well as Jack. I'm not the native Chicagoan, but uh, they made sure whatever we did was was real and relevant for uh, Chicago. So we also had that, that discipline of people that knew the market. So what we were talking about was uh, was resonated not only with the visitor, but also resonate resonated with the uh, with the local community as well. Well, and I'm really glad you brought up Melissa. Always done amazing work. Um, I saw her just a month ago on the ECM con conference. She was on the EDI panel. Fantastic marketer. Okay, so now I'm a fly in the wall, and it's it's you and Melissa and Jack. Isn't it interesting that you know, in especially um, you know, in in the summer 2021 when we look at community shared values, one of the key aspects that we have to remember is we're always marketing the relevancy of the DMO, of the destination organization, not just to the visitor, but to our to our um, home constituents. And I, I think that's a role that's only going to grow, not in a, in a virtual signaling kind of way, hey, look at what we do, here's our numbers, because we've tried that. We've tried telling people, just look at the numbers we create. And the numbers are big and they're impressive. I, I've heard you talk on this many, many times. We've, we've had a pretty halcyon era of tourism growth, but the kind of things we need to communicate to stakeholders are, are the things that that we weren't communicating to them before, that weren't getting through with the numbers, that, that sense of attachment. Um, your friend Greg Oates and mine um, talks about Fort Worth pivoting and really being able to, to do well at the beginning of the pandemic because they'd already built some of those intentional networks outside of what he called the usual suspects. Yeah, first of all, again, looking at Chicago, you know, we had a, we had a group of people that were either that adopted Chicago as their hometown. So everything we did had this 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 reality to it. It was rooted in uh, not something that was ethereal in its planning. It was it was tangible. Um, you know, we didn't go into every neighborhood, all 50 neighborhoods in Chicago and tried to go across the board. We understood the elements there. And, you know, and that's what has been so great to see what I think's transpired during this very challenging year of the pandemic. We've seen our members across the board, David, do incredible things, you know, and do it with half the team they had prior to March of last year, doing it with basically on a shoestring budget. But it's amazing when there is that, that uh, unification coming together between the team, uh, the, the CVB or DMO in that community and its stakeholders to begin, you know, that welcoming process to get people back. And it's, it's been magical to watch it. And we're fortunate, you know, we get a chance to see the work of over 600 destinations in 15 countries. And yeah. uh, in some cases, it's really, really grassroots. And in some cases, uh, as the work uh, Toronto's done recently, uh, I know you've seen that as well as New York City, to begin inviting people in their own community to come back. Hey. I, I, I'm I'm really glad you said that. The um, just the barometer on the idea that this thing that we are all talking about and sharing, and this is one of the things we like to do on the show, is it's actually happening. That's the good news. Don Welsh said it today. He's been around and around more than you and I have been lately. It's part of his purview and what he does. And the stakeholder piece is happening. People, if they're not doing it, they're starting to do it. They're looking at it. Um, we all need to do that. It's happening, David. You know, I had the good fortune a couple of weeks ago to to really go to my first full blown conference, and that was at uh, WTTC down in Cancun. And I will tell you, the people that are contemplating going to meetings, uh, I will tell you across the board, no matter what the meeting is, uh, whether it's fifty people or five hundred people, you know, the safety and health of of every attendee is the highest priority. The protocols we went through in order to be able to attend WTTC and then stay in Cancun while the meeting was going on. 
uh, some of these best practices are being shared uh, around the world. So people are traveling, airplanes are full, certain states, certain cities are ahead of others. I was in the Florida panhandle last week. I visited three of our members and they're having record years. And I think it's showing that people, you know, feel that safety and comfort to get in their car with their families now. And whether they're in a, you know, home or whether they're in a hotel, uh, we're starting to see full airplanes and, and cities uh, getting back into high levels of occupancy and performance. This is, this is great stuff. Let's talk about compression. We opened up by saying that, you know, and I, you know, Dan, Dan, well, I think from CrowdRiff, Absolutely. you know, the, the innovations of the next five years got jammed into 18 months. That was last, that was March 2020's prediction. Here we are, you know, rolling into the summer of 21. We know we've got, you know, 18 more months of strangeness. It's not the way it was. So that, that, takes almost 10 years of innovation and jams it into three years. What kind of, of innovations, what, what kind of pressures have you seen come out of COVID? I've seen a lot of positive things. I think it moved the needle on stakeholder engagement. I think it pointed out the essential nature that when you have people coming into your market, um, your locals better be supportive and, and, and helpful. And, and you talked the other day about, you know, the pressures of over tourism. Isn't it funny that the, the, um, the idea of safety of our destinations is a little bit analogous to over tourism in the sense that it raises the awareness of the locals to be more careful about who comes, why, and does it have value? So I see that kind of acceleration. I see we're so much better at digital now. I mean, uh, I think of my you know first couple months of really clunky, clunky <laughs> Zoom calls and strange things. Um, but the other big one for me is it really has changed how we talk about and deliver uh, towards messaging, not just to our stakeholders and our markets, but to our visitors, because this has become, prior to the pandemic, almost 80% of tourism research was being done on mobile devices, pads and phones in a leisure home setting. It's probably closer to 90% now. What other, what other changes do you think we've been compressed with? I, I'll throw on the table EDI. We know that, that the events of last year have brought that to the forefront and the importance of data. What do you see in the compression? You've thrown a lot out there. And I'm, I'm gonna I see. threw it out there so you'd have some hooks. No, no, Pick I'm going to a little bit. Number one, um, I will say this is probably the most powerful tool we, we have and will continue to have. And uh, it's been interesting looking at a lot of the data and research that even during the darkest of times of the COVID, you know, back in March, April, May, when there was a lot of uncertainty and, you know, um, infection rates were, were off the chart. We didn't have the vaccines in place. It's ironic that if you go back to looking what, what kept people probably sane to some degree was actually planning trips that for the most part they knew potentially were going to be canceled or high probability they were going to be canceled. So I think if you get back to that is the premise that travel is going to stop and clearly the pandemic stopped it. But we're beginning to see that recovery now. And I think along the way it's given both capital investment in certain places, the chance almost to play catch up. Because as you know, in the past decade, when you're running 80, 90% hotel occupancy on an annualized basis, you don't really get a chance to do renovations on the product. Uh, airports don't have a chance to slow down uh, when they've got you know, uh, you know, the flights that we had back in, in March of 19. And, and I've seen the airport infrastructure. Look at LaGuardia now, look at Washington Reagan. You know, airports that had been so, they had a chance actually to work on major capital infrastructure. So you start looking at that as a, as a positive. And I will tell you, there, there's been one piece of work that just really blew me away, and that was Hawaii. Hawaii knew probably in 2018, 2019, that it was almost hitting the point of saturation in terms of tourists coming into a lot of the islands, and in particular, Oahu, Waikiki. And what that did was it, it, it took this beautiful part of the world that we all aspire to get to and visit, and um, it made it not real fun for locals. And, um, and, you know, in terms of employment opportunities were there, it was strong, but really it, it had taken away some of the magic of Hawaii. And I will tell you, John Fries, the new CEO came in, and before he began doing anything, they began this exhaustive research by island to go in and meet with the key stakeholders the hotels, the restaurants, the attractions on that island, you know, rental car companies. Then they met with the locals and they tried to come up with a formula by island 
to really determine what is the optimum number of visitors that still makes it a special uh, visit for the for the visitor coming in without without taking away the joy of locals living there and taking care of those customers. So this is probably the the the, the most extensive research that I've seen to get us to the point where it will be the right balance of the economic impact and visitation along with it's like living in Hawaii. And I just thought that was great. And I don't know when that could have probably taken place at a better time than it was when the islands were basically in a, in a you know, 10, 20% occupancy. So I, I just, David, have just seen some incredible work. You know, you touched on EDI. Um, something we've been working on for three years. Again, I got to give Melissa Cherry and our, and our co-chairs, um, Kelly Henderson, John Percy, and Al Hutchinson, along with about 65 um, committee leaders now that have brought this to life. But, you know, there needs to be those moments in time as painful as they can be to sort of kickstart things. And even though we've talked about it, you've been on our board and very active with us, uh, nothing kickstarted EDI more so than the, the, the death of George Floyd. And, you know, and some other deaths that occurred. And I think those, when you look back in terms of those lives lost, you know, there are things that, that are tangible results that have come out from it. And that's what, uh, you know, you want something like that, that it's not just a loss of life without something to show for it. And then I gotta tell you, I, I'm so proud of the people that I work with, the Elliot Ferguson's, the Al Hutchinson's, the Melvin Tennant's, you know, men that I, that I have immense respect for and the industry has respect for. You know, they came out and spoke from the heart what it's like to be in this industry as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a black man. And I'll tell you, it's been, uh, there's movement. There's great things taking place. And I'm pleased to say that we have over 300 CEOs now that have signed the pledge in terms of equity, diversity, and inclusion for their organizations and their cities. So I'm happy to talk further about this because I think it's, uh, it, traction has is, is begun. Well, as I said, I'm, I really am, and I mean this with the greatest sincerity, very grateful for the work that DI has been doing under your leadership. Let's talk about the next chapter, and I think it actually plays off those people you just listed. One of the key pillars, one of the areas of focus has been, but going forward will be amplified, is transformational leadership, um, something you and I both believe heavily in. But tell us a little bit about DI and transformational leadership. And I think you just listed off a lit litany of transformational leaders that, that I am so proud to be associated with. Well, you know, what, what makes us equally, by the way, transformational leadership, we have our CEO summit coming up in two weeks in, uh, in Tampa. I wish that the uh, Canadian U.S. border was open so uh, we'd have all our Canadian CEOs coming down. But nonetheless, um, this, the, whole, the whole thing is built around transformational leadership. And, uh, and, and I believe a lot of that started before COVID, but clearly that accelerated, you know, and, and I would get to the point where I use a bit of a traditionalist, traditionalist like me that used to think, by the way, from a hotel, airline and CBB days, you've got to be in the office to do your job. You've got to be in the office to, to be effective. Well, I'm sitting in my home office in Delaware right now, and I would tell you I'm probably more effective here than I would be if I were sitting in D.C., so I, I would say right now is, um, you know, we're getting to the point where our CEOs are challenging um, their destinations in terms of equity, diversity, and inclusion. Does my team look that way? Does my city look that way? Does my board of directors look that way for opportunities? Because you mentioned also one of the great challenges we have in our industry continues to be um, employees. You know, can we can we get that next generation of employee to decide to come into the CVB world? Uh, because we know right now, if they're con if they're considering coming into hospitality, we know the big hotel brands, the big restaurants, the big attractions are recruiting them right out of college. But what are we going to do that now? So um, some of the transformational leadership is going to be built around EDI principles, um, and some of those may be us us now as an industry going after the universities to talk about the great work we do and attract young men, men and women um, of color coming into the industry. And, and I don't know whether we've ever really done that before. And uh, with Melissa and this team leading this and the, the commitment that's been made, that's just one area alone. Community shared value to me is another area, David, that uh, transformational, because you're talking about something different the way we've always done it. And again, I'm guilty of that as well. Jack uses me as a perfect example always talking about numbers and, you know, and people glaze over, you know, but tell me how that, how that affects my community and my neighborhood and why I should pay attention to tourism. 
So a lot of good examples. And I think um, the men and women who lead our industry around the world, you know, they've been tested beyond belief uh, in this past 12, 14 months. And the way they've risen to the occasion, um, that to me says a lot about transformational leadership. Well, it's certainly the crisis puts a spotlight on leadership and we've seen it around the world and we can all point to examples of leadership where we find it wanting. But in this industry, I for sure will say I am impressed with the leaders who've stepped forward from the from the small rural destinations who've stepped up and done things that have amazing value to their local stakeholders, to the big destinations that have shifted their thinking to the to the uh, Michael Nagy's from the um, Copacabana Fairmont in, in Rio, who said the smartest thing we did in COVID is we stopped owning our own content. I mean, what a bold move for, for a, a chief of sales for the Fairmont. I'm seeing these leaders all over, and I'm just glad that we get a chance to, to share them both on the Future Tourism podcast, but also through DI. I'm really happy to hear about your continuing tutelage of the 30 under 30, and now there's 10 over 20 or what's how does that work <laughs> now we're we're going to continue to focus on that 30 under 30 group i'm pleased to say that uh this past year ironically during COVID, we had the highest number of submissions for uh, those 30 coveted spots and the competition's been tough but i think it's also reflected by the way of the fact that these ceos and leaders know that the leaders of tomorrow they need to invest more in them now absolutely absolutely all right. It's a great pleasure to have you on the show. Um, we've been running at this for half an hour, so I'm going to give you a chance for some final thoughts. If you could share um, a couple points with your peers, how do we get through this better? Um, what do we need to do? And um, any other thoughts you want to share in closing? I think one of the things we have learned and we've learned effectively is that the um, CVBs have become really the voice of their communities. Uh, and sometimes we've not always been that way. So we've earned that seat at the table during these very challenging times. I think the most important thing now, how do we keep that seat at the table and continue to stay relevant, whether it's within city gov government, federal government, whatever it may be? Because, you know, I work for a guy named Rahm Emanuel, as I told you, who coined the saying, never let a good crisis go to waste. And, uh, and I don't mean that to be in a flippant manner, but I'd say right now we've got momentum. We've got momentum with our key stakeholders in our communities, as well as our elected leaders. Let's keep that momentum going. And uh, I just think for those destinations that may be a little ahead of others, keep the faith. You know, the, the strategies you've used in the past were probably going to work in the future. But as you talked about, the power of our phones and having real-time data is going to be critical for people to make decisions for their personal travel, their family travel. And the one thing I've said since the beginning, David, I don't think you can hurry people to make the process to travel again. When they feel it's right and safe for themselves, their families, their companies, that's when we're going to see people get back on the road. And hopefully for the larger cities, um, it's going to be super critical that we get people back into the downtown environment, these urban communities, whether it's in their offices, because I do think that business traveler brings a dynamic in the city and allows that that restaurant, you know, Sunday through Thursday evening uh, to do well. And uh, I know we miss them as well as the, the global passenger who will hopefully will be back in the next couple of years when the borders reopen. And it's safe. Well, I know we all miss traveling. Um, and uh, so many people have said uh, on the show, when this, when we reopen, they just feel a sense of traveling with much more purpose. And I, I totally, I totally get that. It, it, it was always appreciated. It was always a great thing, but I think we'll appreciate it all that much more now knowing that it, it can go away and it's, it's fragile and needs to be, needs to be looked after. David, I went to uh, Roger Dow's uh, board meeting uh, a while back in Tampa, and I happened to walk in. And I forgot to take my lanyard off, you know, with my name tag on. And I walked into a restaurant, and I got to tell you, there was a big smile from the general manager and say, man, we've missed you all. You know, we've missed the meeting attendee coming in. So I agree with you. I think that sometimes when business is so good and so strong for such a sustained period, when it goes away, I think that uh, that visitor is going to be coveted and welcome back to a degree they've not seen before. Don, thanks. Thanks for being here. It's always a great pleasure to talk to you. Your your depth in this industry and all the parallel industries with it is, is amazing. Great work at, at DI. And I look forward to having you back maybe in the fall and we'll talk about how things went. 
I'd love to, David. Thank you. It's always great being with you.